Can they hear us? They can hear us. I should stop they sure talking. can. Yep. You totally <laughs> like super pro beginning. Thank you very much. Hello, viewers. <laughs> um, <laughs> Welcome to Breakfast Club. This is, um, we are inhabiting the same level of production quality we always do. Today is episode 32, and we are welcoming Richard Ross, who is a researcher in the Academy's Albright Lab. Hey, Rich. How are you doing, Laurel? Good morning. Good morning, I everyone. Hope, I hope everyone got to hear you singing like shortly before we click that because oh, it was, I hope so you know, too. I enjoyed it. Yeah. Yeah. Because um, I am, I am a pro. Mm hmm. And you are also a, um, a specialist in cephalopods and coral spawning, which is a role that you moved into after years spent managing our two hundred and twelve thousand dollar, not dollar, gallon, geez, um, Philippine coral reef exhibit as a senior biologist with the Steinhardt Aquarium. Is that correct? Yes, that is correct. All right. Yeah, yeah. All so yeah? you've got it nailed. Nice, thank you. Um, and you're actually here today. Um, on really serious business, which is settling the debate around Earth's top 10 CEPHs. So aside from the fact that I basically assigned you that title, what gives you the yes. right, sir? <laughs> 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 um, and how, how, you know, to what extent can we trust that your conclusions today are correct? Well, uh, uh, I, can, I can only tell you what other people have said about why you should trust, not even why you should trust me, but that seem to trust me. Um, uh, 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 NPR seems to trust me. Ira Flato <laughs> seems to trust me. Adam Savage seems to trust me. Penn Jillette seems to trust me. So um, I, I know, uh, and other Ceph scientists seems to trust me. So that's why. And because yeah. look, I'm wearing an orange shirt. Why wouldn't you trust somebody in an orange shirt about yeah. cephalopods? Yeah. I thought you handled that pretty well, considering that was kind of yeah. a mean question. So thanks, thanks for entertaining. No, it wasn't. That. But I, I have been studying them for for man since I was 15. I think the first ceph that I engaged with, I was 14 or 15 years old in a home aquarium uh, when we really didn't know what we were doing with home aquariums, mm -hmm. and. Uh, and then I, I, in, after college, I kind of took a break from all of that. And then when I became a stay-at-home dad, my wife said, you should do aquariums again. You should get into stuff. So I did. And then I was able to find some. I'll tell you about the, Cephs, the intro to Cephs uh, with the first Ceph. But yes, I've been working on them for a long time and um, breeding them at home, breeding them to the academy and studying them in the wild, all kinds of stuff. So I know some stuff, but... I don't know all stuff, but I know why these are the top 10 best cephalopods <laughs> ever. And you, I was going to ask you about how you got started. You did, you just, as a, as a kid, just immediately were fascinated by aquariums and, and rearing things. Mm -hmm. Yeah. By the time I was 13 or 14, I probably had 25 aquariums in my bedroom. Oh, wow. uh, and my parents, my parents were very, very generous, um, you know, cause every once in a while it, something would leak and it would be raining downstairs in the house. And yeah. uh, somehow they never made me get rid of everything. So uh, I have I have to thank them for that. They also um, encouraged me to scuba dive. So I learned to dive when I was about 15. And, um, and so those two things just came together yeah. as something I really loved. And so yeah. I was into underwater photography with cephalopods. And then let's say when I got back into aquariums, uh, when my daughter was four or three, I, uh, uh, I jumped into cephalopods whole hog. It was kind of crazy at the time. Yeah. yeah. Oh, cool. Yeah. Okay. Um, yeah. well, I'm pretty eager to get started and, uh, okay. I will say that, um, so viewers, <clears throat> I'm just going to stay on screen throughout this whole thing so that, um, Rich has someone to laugh at his jokes. Not that they don't deserve <laughs> it, but not all of them do. Um, and uh, so you're welcome to just ask questions at any point and we'll kind of work them into the conversation um, on Facebook. Just leave them in comments on YouTube, leave them in the chat. And Rich, I'm going to go ahead and um, give you your slides. I'm not going to tell I, I, I'm not going to tell you that um, there's someone on YouTube who is actually sad about missing you, uh, missing your singing, because I feel like that missing just the singing? caters to that bad impulses. So let's just go ahead. You want a part of that magic. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so we're going to talk about uh, the cephalopods. I have this slide in so I know what's going on. Um, oh, I have to click on this, don't I? Otherwise, it doesn't mm -hmm. control. There yeah. we go. So this, the first cephalopod we're going to talk about is a sepia bendensis. Uh, this is the dwarf cuttlefish, and uh, it's the first one I really started working with when I got back into 
aquariums when my daughter was very small uh, and I needed something to distract me from her because they're pretty self-sufficient when they're infants. Um, when I got into it, there was an aquarium store by me that would get this animal in from time to time. And it was not great. When they're adults, they don't ship very well. And um, I wanted to play with them and try to breed them. And one time they got a couple in. So I got several of them at the same time with the idea to breed them. But then they got eggs in. And uh, I was able to uh, get those eggs and have, having no idea what to do. There was very little, there was nothing on this particular species of cuddle at the time. And there we go. Um, so I had to figure out how to raise them based on what some people were doing with some other cuddles. This is uh, one of them here, uh, um, what, checking out my wife. I think we were in, where were we in here? In some Indo-Pacific place that I can't remember. How, how great is my life that I can't remember? Yeah, that sounds was. a little, little fancy. Um, yeah, it's it seems terrible. I'm a bad person. Uh, but this guy uh, would come and hang out next to her and was using her regular hose as cover. And we sat there for about 10 minutes before someone made us move because we were the kind of divers who will look at one thing for 40 minutes. Uh, but uh, it's pretty cool. You'll see my wife again in a picture uh, with a cephalopod in a little while. Um, so these guys are very cool. They mate. Uh, So oh, that's all wrong. <laughs> wow, look at that. That's interesting. Okay, we'll see what happens. Okay. Oh, we're going to just skip that then. There we go. They made face to face. The video is messed up. Um, mm -hmm. uh, perhaps I should say cephalopods are animals. Uh, it means head foot cephalopod. And generally they have all of their limbs arranged in a circle around their mouth. Uh, and most of the time inside of their mouth, they have a parrot-like beak. They have blue blood. They have three hearts. Uh, some of them have a cuddle bone. Some of them have a pen. Some of them have no bones at all. Um, they are mostly made of meat, so they're very delicious to almost everything in the ocean. Um, they're, they also eat meat, so they're very good predators. They're, uh, they can be ambush predators. They can be attack predators. They, they kind of do whatever needs to be done. Um, so they're very cool animals. I think uh, yeah. this is a group of pandensis eggs and uh, that, that's the female laying them and the, the eggs, some weird transition things are happening. We'll just deal with it. Um, the eggs look like a bunch of grapes and as with this species, some ink is incorporated into the egg when it's laid. And as the eggs develop over about a month, they expand and get more translucent and you can begin to see the, the baby cuddles inside of yeah. the actual egg. This is one of the first cuddle pictures I took that I was proud of. This was like in 2003 or 2004. Uh, and I was very excited that you could actually see the cuddle developing. The cuddle's on its back. I could never get one of the cuddle, um, you, you know, uh, situated like you would normally see it. Uh, mm -hmm. But I, you know, cause right in the middle there, you can see it's funnel. Um, and that only sticks kind of out of the bottom. That's what they use for their jet propulsion. Mm -hmm. Steps are just amazing, right? Um, let's see what else. Uh, and then they, when they hatch, that's just one on top of the egg. I was pretty happy with that photograph as well because uh, they're just so cool. Uh, they're about the size of a pea right now. They're really, really small when they're hatched. As they grow, a black screen appears. <laughs> oh, there's, there's, there's their scale. There's our scale. Uh, it's not actually on the dime. The dime is underneath the container. Money contains copper and copper can be bad for mollusks and cephalopods. Uh, cephalopods are mollusks. They're related to snails, uh, but they're much faster snails. Uh, but that's about the size uh, when they're hatched. And Rich, well, this is, so yeah. this, I, this kind of relates to the very first video you showed and you were talking about how they're their kind of limbs are arranged around their heads. Do those, um, mm -hmm. we call them We call them arms or we call them tentacles? It depends on the animal ah. and it depends on what it does. So arms, like an octopus has arms. It doesn't mm -hmm. have tentacles or legs. And okay. we call them arms uh, because they behave more like arms than legs <clears throat> for the most part. They use them like you and I would use our arms to mm -hmm. crawl around with. Mm -hmm. um, 
And the main difference, though, between the uh, now a cuddle has eight arms and two tentacles, okay. and the <clears throat> the tentacles are in this species. There can be debate whether they're limbs or not. It's kind of their appendages, uh, but the the arms they have definitely have eight arms. The two tentacles kind of live in pockets inside the skirt where all the arms are. So they're in here. And when they go to prey on something, they shoot the tentacles out. And at the tip of the tentacles, they have what's called a tentacular club. And on that club, there's all kinds of grabbing appendages. So with squids, there'll be big, nasty hooks and suckers with serrated teeth. And um, with a cuddle, there's it's mostly just suckers. And then they grab their prey and they bring it back in. And then the arms grab it. And then the beak is in the middle of all those arms and starts chomping away. Um, <clears throat> A tentacle generally does not have suckers up and down its length, maybe just at the club at the tip, uh, mm -hmm. whereas an arm will have uh, suckers up and down its entire length. Okay. So th okay. that's kind of the difference. So, so okay. a nautilus okay. has tentacles, like over 90 tentacles, and, mm -hmm. uh, um, and that's it. The, all the other stuff mostly have arms. Squid have eight arms and two tentacles. Cuddles okay. have two arms and two tentacles. Eight, eight, uh, sorry, eight arms and two tentacles. Yeah. And that's that. That's how that goes. Does okay. that make sense? I guess it does. I'm and I, that's why I asked because I saw two that seemed to be functioning a little differently than the others. And I was like trying yeah. to understand how it work. Yeah, that's perfect. I got you. Um, there should yeah, be yeah. video of hunting uh, either with this species or with a different species coming up. Okay. So we're, we'll get to all of that, I think. But uh, the questions are very helpful. I'm glad you're here because so sometimes I'm not sure if I've explained something in a way that actually makes sense or not. Yeah, totally. So, and we've got another question too. Brandy was curious whether they're venomous. And I think <clears throat> she may mean broadly Seth, but. Thanks. Yeah, we. Um, it's probable that all cephalopods have some kind of cephalotoxin some kind of venom in their bite. Hmm. And it's likely that it's, um, yeah, no, I don't want to start telling where it comes from. So it's likely they have some kind of venom in their bite. Um, the, the one that you that we hear the most about is the blue ring octopus, yeah. which has got yeah. tetrodotoxin, which is really bad, which will shut down your, um, uh, your, your pulmonary system. So you'll stop breathing and your blood will stop pumping. But if you get CPR fast enough, you'll recover. Um, so if anybody's keeping any of those animals, which you shouldn't, cause they can kill you. There's no reason to have an animal that will kill you in the house unless you have a really good reason. And almost nobody does, um, to have a card in their wallet and on the tank that says, if you find me laying prone first, watch out for this octopus that's running around. And second, please give me CPR now until I start breathing. Here's some links. Um, because otherwise they might not, or cause they have to keep giving it to you. Right. Right. So uh, I right. think that all cephalopods have some form of cephalotoxin in varying degrees of potency. <laughs> <clears throat> it seems clear that some of the other animals I'm going to show you have coloration that seems to say, yeah, I'm toxic. Stay away from me. Um, whether uh, and again, you know, this this part of cephalopod research never seems to get enough money thrown at it. So we don't have any definitive answers. Mm -hmm. um, there was some information that some of the species had a, um, that had a, a toxins in their flesh. Uh, and that was on one show called Kings of Camouflage. That's never been uh, uh, supported. It's never been refound. It's, we, ha we, so I, I don't know about that, but it, yeah. it's good to assume all cephalopods have some kind of toxin and uh, you want to do that. You want to assume that because you may be uh, allergic to that toxin. So even a mild bite might not be mild for you. So right. there's just really no reason to be grabbing animals in right. general. Right. right. Yeah. Okay. Great. Good <laughs> all right. <laughs> this is a bunch of, uh, a, unless you have a good reason, this is a bunch of baby cuddles when they're small. Yeah, and then that's a lot from a bunch of different egg clusters, uh, and they can be they, they generally don't eat each other at this at this stage, although they sure can. Uh, but they're a little bit easier to feed when they're this small and make sure they're getting enough food. Uh, they're just and they don't eat as big food, so they're not really looking to eat each other. Mm -hmm. um, here's here's our first video. No, that's a lie. I've shown like six videos. Um, <laughs> this was one of the first videos I made. Um, and it's, uh, it's set to Darth Vader's theme, uh, because I was so entranced with these guys looking like little star destroyers, 
uh, as they swam around and clustered and hunted. Oh, really? So you'll be able to see them hunting here in a second. You see them all zero in on that on that fish that's swimming. Yeah, deciding, I Yeah, and they decide when it's close enough uh, to be able to take a shot. And uh, none of them thought that it was particularly good at that point. Uh, this one's coming. There you go. Do you see the two tentacles shoot out at the bottom yeah. there? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so that's that's what those guys do and what they look like when they're little, and they're just super cool. Uh, oh, here we go. And this was this was like in 2004 when we really had no idea what to do with these guys. Um, there you go. And two two got it at the same time, and then they'll fight over it for a while, and then they'll <laughs> share it and kind of eat it at the same time sometimes if they can do that. Um, so so we know what we were doing with these guys, or I didn't know what I was doing with these guys at the time, but I was able finally to close the life cycle. Uh, I was the first person to close the life cycle and then um, was able to close the life cycle again when I started at the academy. And that made the academy the first place to breed these guys. And so that was pretty exciting stuff. And now they're kind of a staple in the aquarium world, which is great. Um, I'd mm -hmm. much rather have captive breeding these guys than collecting them. They don't ship yeah. really well. We'll get into that in a little bit. And when you say closing the life cycle, that means basically figuring out how to how to have them born in captivity. Yeah, well, I actually did the whole thing. So I raised babies from eggs. I see. Raised those babies all the way up, got them to mate and lay eggs, and then was able to have babies from those eggs. So that's the full life cycle done in tanks. Okay. Uh, which is a cool thing. Here's just another video of feeding. Cephalopods eat a lot, uh, and whatever you think that means to you they eat more than that. Uh, and here's a bunch of them again, just coming out and hunting because this kind of stuff never gets old. And wow. it, it's just, they're very, very cool. Uh, telling males and females is very difficult. Uh, I can kind of do it with 70 or 80% accuracy based on behavior or color. You can see, uh, I'm pointing to a screen. That's not going to help these guys here making the really dark patterns and facing off like this. Those mm -hmm. are, are, are Likely two males. Um, this is likely a female, and that's that's their skin has all these chromatophores on it, and they can change their color and do these passing cloud um, uh, behaviors. That's that's what that behavior is called because it reminded someone once of a cloud passing over yeah. them in the water. Yeah, they have cuddle bones. All right, so uh, the cuddle bone aids them in buoyancy. Uh, by basically pumping ammonia in and out of it and makes them lighter or heavier in the water. Um, and I said before that they can eat each other. This you can see here is uh, what was left of the flesh of the cuddle that got eaten by another cuddle. And this is the cuddle bone. And you can see these bites out of it, right? They look like shark teeth. Yeah. That's absolutely the beak. It's I'm telling you, it's a parrot's beak. It's oh, wow. is what it looks like. And you can see in that picture that it was just taking chunks out of that uh, as it was eating. It was getting some of the calcium from the uh, from the cuddle bone as well. Um, oh, wow. so, so besides not wanting to get cephalotoxin in you, um, a parrot beak biting you is not a good time. Yeah, that's not squishy at all. Yeah. And you know, the, and and I I'm spending a bunch of time on these because they're my favorite because they're the, they're really the first ones I worked with in mm -hmm. any in any real sense, uh, and I just I just love them so much. I just think they're cool. You can see the W shaped pupil, which allows them to kind of get two pupil openings. At least that's what the literature says, uh, which is supposed to aid them in uh, being a, in in hunting and seeing everything. Uh, you can see. Kind of at the bottom here, you can see there, um, those are the tentacles actually waiting to be deployed right here. It's kind of oh, interesting. Wow. wow, yeah. Uh, oh, they have they have a, uh, a fin that goes around their entire body, uh, mm -hmm. around the middle of their mantle, and that's what they use for propulsion. So they're, these are, you can call these guys hummingbirds of the sea. They kind of flit around and zip around and hover and then when they're scared, they get they jet propulsion themselves out of the way so you can't see them. They'll spit out some ink too. Ink has got two kind of ideas between ink. One is to make a smoke screen that's probably got some irritant in it. And the mm -hmm. other is to make these blobs called pseudomorphs. Mm -hmm. And so the idea is that when a hunter comes in, it doesn't know which blob to shoot for. So leaves these blobs and then the cuddles way over here and the hunter's still with the blobs. So yeah, yeah 
evolution is is super awesome. Okay. It is. Octopus really Cyania. We're on to the next one. Cyania. This is my my favorite octopuses. This is. Can you see the octopus in the picture, Laura? No. Yeah. Uh, I mean. You got it. Okay. Like, yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. No, I don't got it. This here. Can you see my cursor? Yes. Oh, I my see it. I see it. This yep. is the octopus here. Wow. Um, and that's great because that's exactly what it's supposed yeah. to look like. You're supposed to not know if it's coral or not. This was um, taken on the edge of Blue Corner in Palau. Actually, this was just this year, um, which has been 20 years long, um, which is why it feels so long ago. Um, and there was like five divers right there. And, and this one was clearly going, checking us out, but going, I don't know who you are or what you are. I don't want you yeah. to see me. Uh, yeah. I think this is an octopus is octopus, right? This is when people say octopus, this is what they think of. They are not all like this. They are all not, they are not this intelligent seeming. They are not all this interactive. Uh, they mm -hmm. are not all this strong. This is the kind of octopus that is absolutely going to try to escape from wherever you put it. Um, they're going to be able to pull things down. Um, they're, they are strong and interactive. Do not get an <laughs> octopus like this unless you have a big tank and are willing to definitely engage with it uh, because it, it wants to, it, it, it wants stuff. Um, they're very cool <laughs> animal. This is, this is one found all over the world, Cyania. This is the one, if you go to Hawaii, this is the one you're going to eat. Um, uh, when they fish it, and they also use it as bait. What's the common name? Um, Hawaiian day octopus or a day octopus. Okay. Mm -hmm. Um, it's kind of a, and they're in the Indian Ocean. They're kind of everywhere. Uh, in fact, in this one, there were two. There was another one in this picture just to the side, and uh, they ended up chasing each other around. So th there were sharks swimming all over. You go to this place to see sharks, and you hook in and let the current just kind of hold you like a kite. And then yeah. you can just watch the sharks. On this dive, I was like, forget that. And I was like crawling around, chasing the octopuses around, getting underneath other people, being generally annoying. But the thing I have learned is that uh, when you're diving and having an experience with animals that you study and are passionate about, you, you better push the rules just a little bit uh, to make sure you get the experience you want. I, I couldn't yeah. think of anything horrible than than being on the hook and seeing these octopuses and not being able to go look at them. Yeah, um, and that is not academy advice for the record. That is Rich no, Ross advice. No, <laughs> that's Rich Ross advice. When you're diving, make sure you see what you want to see. Hey, we have a question uh, from Heather. Um, yeah, hi, and Heather. She, she writes, I've heard that um, they communicate by writing messages on their bodies. Is this true? Writing's a little bit of a strong word for me. Uh, I want to be not anthropomorphic if I can avoid it, but they definitely do signal to each other. And I'll have some more video of, of other animals doing that later on. Okay. Um, yeah, you can, you can swim with a squid. I remember once with a squid and there was some other squid on the other side and the big squid was between me and the other squid and facing me, it was this dark kind of aggressive color and pattern and facing the female squid, it was a very light uh, kind of friendly pattern. So they were definitely indicating two different things on two different sides of his body. Uh, mm -hmm. So they, they sure, they sure do use the colors and patterns they can generate to communicate whatever they're communicating to each other. It's probably mostly aggression or, or Hey baby uh, would be the other one that I would say they're saying, Hey baby, a lot with their skin colors. I also, I want to give Heather props for putting writing in quotes. I thought that was like a very nice approach. And oh. I also want to get to a question from Gilly, age five, who would like to know about oh. cephalopod poop. Cephalopod Did poop? You... Mm -hmm. Cephalopod poop, it, it's, uh, I don't know much about it. It, uh, it, it comes out, uh, uh, there, there's some, there's some goo to it. There's some solid matter to it and it breaks up very quickly. So I, I don't actually know that much about cephalopod poop. Uh, mostly I look at it as something to make sure I have enough filtration to deal with uh, that, mm -hmm. that can deal with it breaking down. Um, I don't actually know who knows about cephalopod poop. Maybe you'll be the person to figure out all the things that are important about it and bring it to us. So when, when you do that, please let me know because I know nothing about that. Mm -hmm. Gilly, we recommend Google searches and we definitely want to hear what you find out. Yeah, yeah. So cool. 
Um, yeah. This is the Cyania again. This one I actually find harder to spot. And in the background there, you can see, I love this picture because there's a shark back here. Um, there was, a, like I said, there was a school of sharks whipping back and forth, but mm -hmm. sharks, whatever, right? Uh, cephalopods, yes. Sharks, no. <laughs> um, this is uh, this cyan Cyania. You can see in this picture, this is the kind of things they do. Uh, and uh, they're... This is exactly what you want to teach them not to do. Um, uh, so uh, my wife and daughter were in, and so we let them see that. But generally, you if, if they squirt you, you just close the lid and run away because you don't want to train them to squirt uh, because they're just looking for some kind of interaction. But that, that was a fun day. Mm -hmm. uh, we're going to skip that video. Okay. No one cares about that video. We're going to play this video, though, because this is um, some color changing from these animals, and this is always fun to watch. So you see the octopus moving, very light colored. Uh, it moves to a different patch where it's darker, and now it blends in with the where it is, uh, which makes it much harder to see. And you can see on its skin, it's got all those bumps on it, so those are called papillae, and not only can the octopus change the color of its skin, but also the texture. So it can raise and lower these papillae to give it uh, different textures, which also help it to blend in really well. Uh, just amazing. And if you make them angry enough, they just get angry colored and start yelling at you uh, with their with their writing. I like that you had writing in quotes. I should have known that you had writing in quotes, and now I know. All right. Now you know. Coconut octopus. We're, we're moving along. Oh, we're looking at the time, so I want to make sure we keep going. The coconut octopus, Amphi octopus marginatus. Nothing happening. Your slides won't advance? My slides won't. Ah, there we go. This is the octopus. This is also called the vid octopus for a long time, but because of a behavior that we saw in the last 15 or 20 years, they changed the common name. Uh, and looks like it's veiny. Uh, very cool animal. This one's much smaller. It's about the size of my fist um, and smaller. They, they don't get very big. Um, here's some video of me and uh, my pal, Matt Wandell. This was on the Hearst expedition. We were trying to get this one to eat on camera. So we caught a crab, and this octopus would have nothing to do with it. It just kept batting the crab away. It just didn't want the crab away. So that was, that was a fun, fun dive to do. Um, and, uh, yeah, we try again and look at the color changes. Look how white the suckers get mm -hmm. when it's like, get away from me. Um, but it's not really mad. If it was really mad, it would run away. It's just defending itself. Now it's chasing Matt going, get away. Um, <laughs> And the color changes are just amazing. And then really? it closed, you see how it closed itself into the shell? Mm -hmm. So you'll also find them in two halves of scallop shells that they will use as a shell. It's like they're trying to devolve back into snails. Um, I find it hilarious that they That's do wild. that. Uh, this is why they were called coconut octopus, why the name really got, the common name got changed. They were found to use coconut husks or co coconut shells, not the husk, like shells. Like a, like a scallop shell or a clam mm -hmm. shell. Um, let me just play this so you can see what happens. Uh, I'm not sure. This is also some bipedal locomotion. Um, they were also found to walk with two arms for short distances, which was a big deal. But here's this, uh, this oct octopus, and it's got a uh, coconut shell there that it's going to pull up out of the sand. And then it will flip it over so it's like a bowl. And it will Slip. Uh, then use it to protect itself. This is not my footage. Uh, thank Google for this footage. Um, oh, wow. Yeah. Is that bipedal so, movement common among, among octopus? It's not. No, there's been two, I think, two species. Um, this one and um, Adopphus uh, in the same complex have been um, doing it. The algae octopus actually does it much better than this one does. Oh. I think those are the only two. So now it does this pattern called stilting, where it's walking with all of the arms, uh, but it's keeping the coconut shell underneath it. When this was first documented, it got a lot of attention as being tool use. Um, mm -hmm. 
the idea that it's taking this somewhere else to use it later on as protection. Uh, we're not so sure that that's the case. I, I'm a, one of uh, a few Ceph enthusiasts that are kind of known as the dream crushers. If you ask us about this or any of some of the other popular stuff, we kind of say we don't really know that. Um, because while it's walking across the sand with that coconut shell, it is protecting itself the whole time. There are predators that live in the sand all the time. Mm -hmm. We just haven't got on video um, that happening. Mm -hmm. Actually, we do. There's a video of a bobbit worm taking an octopus down. Um, I'll have to send that to a colleague as something to remember. Um, so yeah, so it, uh, either way, whether it's tool use or not, who cares? It's super awesome behavior for a super yeah. awesome octopus. Um, and they, <laughs> they just don't care about you. I love it so much. So this is so a super important question here. This, I feel like this. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. The, uh, coconut octopus seems clearly to be the model for the nope, nope, nope octopus meme. Yes or no? I, I've i seen several versions of the nope, nope, nope octopus meme. So I'd have to see the one that you're okay. talking about. Um, uh, it's probably this one, though. Um, Natalie, age 10, would like to know how long coconut octopus live. So this is the tragic horror story about octopuses. Uh, they don't live very long. Most cephalopods don't live very long. Um, this particular one lives between a year and two years. That's it. Um, the warmer water cephs tend to live shorter lifespans than the colder water cephs. So mm -hmm. giant Pacific octopus might live five to seven years while mm -hmm. these guys live a year or two at the most. Um, this is some footage I have of, of one of these guys opening a jar. <coughs> the Academy, uh, Adam Savage tested just uh, shared. You saw him lift the lid there, which is kind of exciting. Otherwise, you really don't see much. Um, but if you want to check out Adam Savage four-part series trying to make a puzzle for octopuses at the Academy, that's on his page, and it's great. And it's got a whole bunch of Academy people in it. Um, but the 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 jar opening. Uh, oh, this is just a loop. The jar opening. They don't really. You don't put a jar in with a tight lid and then they come over and go, hey, I'm going to open that up and figure out how to open it. If you put a tightly sealed jar, they'll explore it and then they'll leave it alone because they can't make it go and they don't know anything about it. There's no reason for them to think they might be able to open it up or not, right? Yeah. So what we do is we, we put the lid on very lightly at first. And then as the octopus learns that there's food in the jar and it can manipulate that lid, you can tighten it up more. Once hmm. it understands that, it, it, it can open it. So, um, and you just saw it cracked it. It got some of the air out. Um, it didn't like the air. Um, but what, once, it, once it understands, once it knows it can get it food inside, it's learned it. But, mm -hmm. but does it figure it out on its own? That's a whole another question. We're also dream crushers in the term, in, the, in intelligence. Uh, it's great to say, like uh, some common press does, that, that octopuses have the intelligence of a six-year-old child, but that's also kind of a crazy thing to say at the same time, because how, mm -hmm. how could you possibly say that? Mm -hmm. um, so that's enough of that. We're just moving through because it's in the top 10, right? It's the yeah. period. I think it's a period at the end. Yeah. And we had a qu this another question quickly, just in sure. general, are um, insects, are, do males or females tend to be more dominant? Um. Dominant's an interesting question. Uh, so I would say no. Uh, I think we, we hear a lot about aggression of the females because the female um, can kill, strangle, or eat the male after mating. Um, is that really being dominant? I don't know. Uh, the males also get really, really huffy when, um, when they're not mating, uh, you know, with, with territory and stuff like that and with each other. So, um, I'm not quite sure how to actually answer that question. So I would say I would say no. I would say it's about equal with okay. the with the two sexes. Okay, and that was Brandy's question. Thanks, Brandy. That's a great question. I, All right, and, I, and, I, and I love that I don't have the answer. I think that's great. <laughs> I love that we don't know everything. Yeah. Um, Wonderpus. That's how it's spelled. It's called Wonderpus photogenicus, uh, which is kind of a uh, a weird scientific name, a uh, playful name. 
and and that's because they look like this. Uh, uh, when this one became popular uh, with divers, photographers, when it was kind of discovered, um, it's just so amazing looking that they called it the Wonderpus Photogenicus because it was all over everyone's photos for a long That's time. Amazing. Mm -hmm. uh, this is Fontanelle. This is one of the first ones that I had experience with. That's why I have this tattoo of that animal on me. Mm -hmm. um, very cool animal. Uh, at the time, they had only been kept for a couple of months in tanks. People didn't really know what to do with them. <clears throat> this was, you know, 18 years ago, 15 years ago. Um, this is, uh, I named it Fontanelle for a while. I thought every octopus should be named Fontanelle yeah. because they don't, nice. because that's, they're, they're just one giant Fontanelle. Um, I think they're beautiful. They, they, they just make these incredible patterns and the black and white stripes or the dark and light stripes are, yeah. you know, that's a, theory, that's a theme. They do these great defensive postures. <clears throat> uh, they only do it for about a week. <clears throat> After about a week, they realize things are not going to eat them or attack them, so they just kind of stop. Why, why get all bristly if you know there's no reason for it? So they just yeah. kind of stop. So, so all the, the like the blue rings, they look so pretty in the pictures when you see a blue ring octopus. Most of the time, they look like a rock that you can't see. They mm -hmm. only do those behaviors. Um, and, and we'll just talk a second about keeping cephalopods. Um, uh, um, you have to be a real nut to want to keep a cephalopod. Uh, so I don't really recommend it unless you're a real nut with uh, um, who's going to bend over backwards to give them what they need. And you've got at least a year's worth of experience keeping uh, easy to keep captive bred saltwater animals. Uh, there's absolutely no reason to buy one of these on a whim or anything like that. So uh, definitely do your homework. The animals need it. Um, what I did with these guys was try to, because I had actually been to where they're from, I tried to recreate the substrate they're in. And you see them on the substrate all the time, and they dig in. They're crepuscular, which means they're active dawn and dusk, um, but most of the time they're buried. Uh, and so I was really excited about this because, oh, again, oh, I know what's happening. This is a PowerPoint thing. Um, I, was able to get, I was able to get it to dig, which no one had seen at that time. Uh, in kept in in tanks, um, so I was able to do that and keep this animal for nine months, uh, which was a record. We thought it was an age thing, but uh, when I got this animal, it was old. So so that was pretty exciting. And this is what kind of got me into the science of cephalopods. This this made moved me kind of from a a, a home lab person, which I still do because I I never learn, yeah. and. Um, and got me more involved in academia and looking at that kind of stuff and, and being involved there, which was kind of a thrill for me. So it's a, a very cool animal. I'm very happy to have worked with it uh, when I when I did work with it. They hunt in an, an amazing way. Let's see, I'm gonna have to find it again. And for people just, it looks like some people have just joined and they're wondering if this is a, a mimic octopus, but this is a wonder puss, right? This is a wonder puss. We will get to the mimic. Okay. The mimic is on this list. It has to be. Uh, I just want to show you this hunting behavior because it's so cool. And you can see this was filmed with like a real video camera, uh, which is why its quality is so bad now. So this is a male. You can tell because it's got one short arm up uh, the third arm over on the right. Mm -hmm. And it does this umbrella kind of posture where it flares the, the entire skirt open and sneaks their arms out and kind of pushes the prey up and towards the mouth where it can catch it. So this is a, this is an ambush pre, uh, ambush tactic. Uh, very, very, very cool. Yeah. And I think I have a pick of that next. Yeah. So you can kind of see what it looks like a little bit better. And this is kind of in action. Um, they stopped doing this as well because they realized that, that they, they can just throw arms at it and catch it uh, because uh, as they learn in a tank, uh, again, it's, the, the wild behaviors just kind of often go away, even if you give them live food over and over again. Not sure mm -hmm. why. Uh, these are what's called, a, the, in octopuses, you get a small egged octopus and a large egged octopus. There's actually what I call a medium size egged octopus, which we'll talk about as well. But the smaller egged octopuses uh, have a lot more eggs and these paralarvae go out and they live in the water column. They don't really look like octopuses at all. 
Do I have a picture I can show the tattoo? They look like. I mean, we're getting a lot of armpit and not a lot of anything else. Oh, yeah. Okay. Go be, oh, there. Down there. There. Okay. That's a paralarm. I, I bet you Louise didn't show his underarm like that when you had him on. Not yet. Um, but <laughs> not yet. You get him back. The bar has been set. So there are these tiny little things that don't look like octopuses at all. You know, the arms are very short and they go out into the plankton and they swim around for weeks or months before they, and they develop into longer armed animals. And then eventually they settle out of the plankton. That's what settling refers to. And they're more of an octopus. Larger egged octopuses hatch looking like octopuses. Um, a little bit different, but they, they go down to the bottom and they, they behave kind of like octopuses. Hmm. Uh, and then there's a medium egg, but we'll get to that too. Uh, but that's generally, these are a small egg octopus, very hard to raise. No one's really had real success in raising these guys because <clears throat> what they do in the plankton is kind of impossible to know. And what they eat in the plankton is also impossible to know. So feeding them is really, really the hard part. Right. There's been all these blackwater dives um, in the last 10 years, they're starting to get really popular in the last five years where people go out with lights um, or, or that's a bonfire dive. I'm sorry. They go out over deep water and they take pictures of tiny stuff swimming around. So we're getting all these great photographs of cephalopods at different stages of development that we've never really seen. And it's really, really cool. Um, yeah. There's a great blackwater photo group on Facebook uh, that has great, great pictures uh, all cool. the time if you want to check it out. It's very cool. Oh, I didn't need to show you my armpit at all. This is the babies. Um, this is this is a wonderful paralarva. Um, These are fantastic. And you can they don't they don't really look like octopuses at all. It's it's amazing. Just amazing. And you can see that most of their bodies got nothing in it. It's just mm -hmm. so awesome. Yeah. I wish we could, I wish we could feed them more easily. Uh, switching. Metasepia, which is the flamboyant cuttlefish. There's several species of these. This is another one. This is kind of like a hit list of animals that I knew about that never, that I never would have imagined that I would be able to work with. And I've, and I've worked with them. It's just uh, shocking to me, actually, in hindsight, that I've had all the good fortune to do all this. Um, it's a cuddle. It's, uh, right, they're not fish. Cuttlefish is from the Norwegian, which is which means uh, ink from the guts fish oh. uh, because of their ink. Uh, yeah. And then it just became cuttlefish. Uh, I, I like to just call them cuddles in the same way the public aquariums no longer call jellyfish jellies. They, they mm -hmm. now call them jellies, not jellyfish or star, right. sea stars instead of starfish. Mm -hmm. um, I've gained zero traction on that. Nobody <laughs> wants to. No one cares. It's great. I love it. Um, but it's the same kind of animal. It's got eight arms, two tentacles. It's got um, a skirt that goes around. This one has got the papillae that changes the texture of their skin are much more pronounced. Uh, and down here, they kind of use these, you'll see, um, to kind of walk around. They kind of have these pseudopods. Uh, the bandensis do it too, but these guys really do it. So they kind of look you'll see in the video, they look like li little hippos walking around. Um, and of course, the color is just amazing, which is why the common name is flamboyant cuttlefish. Mm -hmm. They have a very tiny cuddle bone, so they actually swim really badly. Um, and they spend a lot of time on the bottom because of that. Like tiny or proportionate to their body relative yeah, to others? Uh, yeah, yeah. Oh. If, you know, the, uh, the same size animal, if the animal was about this big on a bandensis, the cuddle bone would be this big. Hmm. And on um, uh, uh, Metasepia, the cuddle bone would be about a third of that. Hmm. And it's shaped weird. It's, it's a very different mechanism. Um, here's one hunting. You can see right here the two tentacles. Uh, they actually shoot them out as one. And then you can see in slow-mo, and then they open them up at the last second and grab and pull them back into the skirt. Very, very, very cool animals. Here's my wife again with uh, another animal that, that I love. Um, that I had only seen in the wild, and, and I was lucky to see that. Yeah. Um, I think this is a hunting video. Oh, let me get to it. Let's see. It's 
So this is the one thing I didn't realize about PowerPoint. Now I do. So the, here we go. Does that make sense? Do we need to, we should see that again. So That's you'll really see, cool. she sees the shrimp. She triangulates on it. She shoots and pulls it back faster than you can even see. So the tentacular clubs are very sticky, but not very strong. So they want to get it back to the skirt where they have all of their arms and all of their flesh around it to be able to hold it. And then, then they can also bite it and, and kill it. Um, very, very cool. Uh, this is mating. This was actually at the Academy. And I'm just going to let this play because I never, ever thought I would see this. Um, and so that this is the female. And um, I, we were able to get uh, well collected. The female is the bigger one. The male is the smaller one. And uh, and I was screaming back of house when this happened. They were holed up together. They kind of hang out together. Uh, one male will protect the female from other males uh, because there's sperm washing and sperm sharing. And uh, the males want to make sure it's their sperm. But then I saw this happen and I happened to be filming. This is courtship where the male gets off the uh, substrate and it's trying to entice the female kind of like to open up the skirt so they can engage and um, he can deposit a sperm packet into the mantle, which she will then use later to fertilize eggs. On cephalopods, generally, um, they have a specialized arm that delivers a sperm packet and you'll be able to see it go into the female, into the mantle. No, oh, come on. I don't. There. Do it. This is weird, isn't it? This is kind of weird, but this is really cool. Uh, and the, this hadn't really been seen before, uh, especially in tanks. So I lost my mind. Uh, and so they're mating. And uh, I, I was back in the house screaming, um, screaming. This was like the closest thing I think I've ever had to like a transcendent religious experience. I've been chasing <laughs> this animal for 15 years, trying to, to get it to be able to breed it. Yeah. And I was finally able to, to see them mate yeah. uh, and, then, and then was able to produce eggs. Um, I wasn't the first to close the life cycle. We had some, um, uh, some LSS issues that didn't happen. Uh, but very quickly after that, somebody else did. Um, but the eggs, they lay the eggs underneath things, usually inside of a coconut shell. And, um, you can see it's very different than the bandensis. They're white. Mm -hmm. Uh, they incorporate no ink and, uh, uh, and they develop a little bit differently. Uh, but when they hatch, they're about the same size, except they're super cute. Oh, man. Um, because they're so <laughs> colorful. Oh my God. Yeah, that's a lot. That's a lot of cute. Yeah. Again, the dime is not in the water with the animal because the safety of the animal is pretty important. Uh, all right, this is going to do that video thing again. So let me find this because you want to see, you want to see a baby eating. There's the baby bendensis. Uh, it's right after this. So I'm just going to let it play. Uh, here's a tiny, tiny, tiny. It's going to eat that. Ah, right? That's oh, so super cool. How tiny how far is it for people who it's the size of a pea? It's it's smaller than my pinky nail. And I, I love how they put the tentacles out slowly till it gets close enough that they think then then they should shoot it out harder. Um that's something else that's for later. We're not supposed to see that. Um, so those are, I just love that animal. And they move around on the bottom, they're very cute. Again. Very hard to keep. This is not for anybody. I, 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 I moved over to encourage people to not get these animals um, unless they're insane, unless they're nuts. If you're a nut, I can get behind it. If not, An watch videos. Watch videos. Mimic octopus. Um, this is the animal that is, I think this is video, that is was reported on mimicking different animals uh, it's supposed to look like a <coughs> a lionfish or a sea snake or a flounder. This is one of the ones I'm a dream crusher on. Uh, I'm not sure it's actually mimicking anything. Uh, it may just be making displays of leave me alone. Or look, you don't want to touch me because you don't know what I am. Look, you know, when they get, they can get really big and puffy like the, um, like the Wonder Puss did or they can get really weird and black looking and they do kind of look like a snake, but 
to say that is actually mimicking a snake mm -hmm. is a very hard thing for me to get behind. And this um, coloration is consistent? This is what they always look like? Yeah, they can be very dark as well, too. I think I have a picture of that. Mm -hmm. um, I just want to get to the piece of video where it goes into its burrow because that's pretty fun to watch. Okay. Um, and these guys, again, these are crepuscular as well. So they're also out um, in, the, uh, in the early morning and the early evening. And you see how it got all dark, and now it's going into its it's going into its den a little bit, and they will go completely under the sand, and you won't see them anymore if they're mad enough. Huh. Um, but I, I don't, I, yeah, I, I don't want to make them that mad. I I want to watch them, right, uh, and follow them around. Just a super, yeah, super cool. cool animal. Again, very short lifespan, small egged. Um, let's see. Here we go. There's. The, in the same kind of pose, but very dark. I actually mm -hmm. think this one was eating a crab at the time. Uh, and there's a still of that. Uh, the very cool thing about this is uh, um, we, this guy, um, Goddard Cop, got this video of a small fish swimming around with this octopus with the same kind of coloration. And uh, Luis and I wrote a short paper about it. Um, um, a mimic fish mimicking an octopus, mimicking its surroundings is is kind of awesome. Uh, and for people who don't know, Louise is Dr. Louise Rocho, who's our ichthyology, one of our ichthyology curators. Yes, great guy. I like Louise a lot. So you'll see these circles in the video and that's showing you where the fish is. You'll see it better in a minute, uh, but it's definitely there. It's a little jawfish. Now, I've seen that jawfish in the wild and thought, oh, it's color's cool. It's just trying to blend in the same way that the, uh, that the octopus is. There it is down to the bottom left. Um, if you didn't know it was there, you would not see it. Yeah. Uh, and we were very lucky Goddard saw it. Um, it was a very cool behavior, a very wow. cool relationship between these animals. I mean, that's... Yeah. That... That's... I would, I'm confident to say that's mimicry by coloration. Um, just you really, so really excited. cool. I thought you got like frozen three different times. <laughs> <laughs> it's exciting stuff. I, I love it. Yeah. Sepia really Latamonis. Cool. We're switching gears to uh, my one, my third top three favorite cuttlefishes. Uh, Sepia Latamonis is Indo Pacific as well, and they can get to be 50 centimeters, 70 centimeters, a couple of feet long, and weigh 10 pounds. They're big animals. They're heavy. They're very, very cool. Uh, I've seen them in the wild and I was also able to raise them in, uh, at the Academy. Um, and they do this color behavior, this hunting pattern. That is the cuddle making that pattern. They use it for hunting most of the time. Uh, and then they make themselves big and confusing and, then the prey item gets quote unquote hypnotized yeah. and uh, then they will shoot out their tentacles, grab the food and bring it back. Um, if you're interested in this stuff, oh, and then that, that's just insane. Don't really know what that is. They, they've also been seen as juveniles to imitate uh, hermit crabs, imitate, we don't know. It looks like they're imitating hermit crabs. Um, <laughs> So they just do these bizarre things. And these guys only did this, you know, once they learned that they didn't need to do all this to get food, um, they kind of stopped doing it and would just swim over to the food. Why do, you know, why do the dance again yeah. if you don't need to? Um, Where are these found? So these are, Sorry. What? Where are these found? These are found in Australia, Papua New Guinea, um, Palau, uh, mm -hmm. the Indo-Pacific area uh, where – all a lot of these cool animals are found. Oh, there it's doing it again. It's kind of bizarre. Look, I'm flipping all my appendages around. <laughs> I don't know. Did you see that? Okay, that's definitely a hunting behavior. It was also yeah. squirting with the funnel, uh, pushing things around. That also makes a shrimp that's sitting there become more visible. Uh, and here's <laughs> this passing cloud kind of pattern from the back. Uh, there's a special called Kings of Camouflage from Nova, which you can watch which has a great sequence of this in incredibly high def out in the ocean. Um, definitely think you should see that. This was in Borneo. Um, there was this, um, they make these wreck areas. They make these structures underwater because they attract animals. So all the, 
all the so many of the dive spots have them because it brings animals in. Um, the cool thing about this was it was on the house reef. So every morning I could get up at 630, which is when these animals were out. They're also out in the late afternoon, uh, but we were out diving other places then. But I get out up at 630 and go spend an hour with these guys every morning. Uh, and, and just, just for hang scale, out. for scale, yeah. because this, this cuttlefish looks like it's half the size of your wife. How big is this cuttlefish? Uh, about half the size of my wife. <laughs> really? uh, it's big. This animal is big. This picture was a selfie before selfies were a thing which, with me holding the camera out like this at this picture. Um, so it, it, it's a little smaller than it appears, but, but okay. it's big. They're, they're, they get big. They're big. Not as big as the Opima, which gets like a meter long, um, but they're still they're still a huge animal. Yeah, that looks like a really uh, intense conversation. Yeah, it's it was so cool, and they didn't care. <clears throat> I started going back also in the morning because uh, it was it was really me and like a safety guy who was somewhere else, not paying attention. So I could they they just didn't care. I would be really slow and take my time and. Um, this is the female. She's grabbing an egg, and um, this whole this is a palm root, and it was just stuffed with eggs. Um, and because this was that long ago, the 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 video footage, the video gear was just not as good, you know. Sure. Um, yeah. So a lot of that didn't hand out. I, I I as I was putting this these slides together, I was like, man, I wish I just had an iPhone 11, uh, you know, back in 2006. Uh, yeah. Really cool cool device in your pocket. We've got this, uh, big this question from, sorry to interrupt, yeah. but Natalia no age 10, um, would like to know how likely is an octopus egg to actually become a full grown octopus? What are the chances um, of making it? For most of them, like the, uh, um, the ones that put out billions and like hundreds and thousands of eggs, very low. I, I can't give you a number offhand. I I'm sure we could find that number. I don't know it. Uh, but, that kind of strategy where you make a whole lot of babies is generally means that a whole lot of babies don't make it. Right. So I don't know. I know we talk about corals, which I think make more babies, but at every stage we say 99% of, of the babies don't make it. Mm -hmm. um, so you end up with a very small percentage that do. The octopus that have larger eggs have a larger percentage because they're putting more energy into raising the animal before it go the raising the the young before it goes out mm -hmm. um kind of like people you know we, we put a lot of energy into the babies uh and uh take care of them yeah animals yeah. not so much so not not very high great question everything yeah. To eat them. yeah it is a great question thank you uh this is a cuddle bone we found just for scale from a wow. lot of monitors that's not a giant one um but that is a we were screaming underwater we sc scream underwater a lot um what is this oh this is to show when they're little they mimic um mangrove leaves that fall into where they're wow. into the areas where they live uh and and that banana color when it catches prey is really amazing I, i'd like to find out why they do that uh yeah. clearly that one didn't work out um so very, very cool animal. They, they, they'll they actually do this with the current by leaves. So they look a lot like a leaf. So you will swim by them and not know they're there. Oh, babies. Oh, babies. <laughs> Baby video is always the best. So this I didn't expect. I did not expect them to do the hunting behavior. They don't do the color show, but they do the same hunting behavior as the adults do. And these are, you know, three quarters of an inch long, maybe less, maybe half an inch. They're really small. Wow. But I does love the, how, yeah. Does the, um, does the pack hunting, like, is it advantageous? Does it serve to like make it likely that likelier that someone will catch the prey or is there other thoughts on just that as a behavior or a strategy? I, I don't believe that's been looked at in the wild. So we don't know. Uh, huh. I, I think the thought is that they aren't gregarious, gregarious in the wild, that they all just vanish out and do their best. Um, but okay. I, I'm not, I'm not aware of that being studied. Right. Okay. I've seen that on one, there was one dive. Um, I think I was around Util or something and I saw, and it seemed like a pack of cuttlefish. It was like five good sized cuttlefish that were 
kind of hanging out and I wasn't, it was a, a strange thing to see and I didn't know if there was a strategy there or. Those you know. could have been squid. Oh, they could have been. So really? there's, there's squid called, um, um, oh, I can't remember the name. Why can't I remember <laughs> the name? Uh, I'm sorry, but it, it's got uh, sepia toothus. I don't remember the genus. Uh, it's called sepia toothus. Toothus refers to squid. Sepia refers to cuddle. So it's okay. it, it it looks like people often think it's a cuttlefish. Um, mm -hmm. In Florida, <clears throat> um, there are no cuddles in the Americas. So several times a year, I'll get I'll get. Um, communication from somebody saying what kind of cuttlefish is this i saw it in florida it's like i don't even need to see the picture it's not it's, it's a, a squid fool. okay squid. got it um, and then and then the best thing is no it's a cuddle and it's like no it's, <laughs> it's not um I, I always enjoy that um but yeah so i don't i without knowing now i i remember once in thailand i saw three or four feral cuddles at the surface they do have to come together to mate uh, but hanging out gregariously, I don't, it's pretty rare. So I, okay. I would imagine that, that we see that in squid all the time, what you described. Okay. So I don't want to say it's not, um, yeah. but if I were to bet, I would say, I would bet that it wasn't. Got it. Okay, cool. All right. Oh, this is a real gear switch. This is Argonauts, uh, the paper Nautilus. So this is a Nautilus shell. Uh, yeah, Here, I'll get you can switch me back. Way. I have two visual aids. Okay. This is a nautilus shell, um, which is one of the otter cephalopods because it's it lives inside this shell and it's got 90 tentacles and it's got pinhole eye cameras. It's a very weird animal. Uh, did not make it on the list of the top 10 coolest for me because wow. there are so many others. <laughs> this, and a nautilus is its own thing. It's its its own genus. It's its own animal. It's It's definitely different. This is the shell of a paper nautilus. And you can see this one is really, the Nautilus shell is very hard. This is uh, very flexible. Um, it's not showing well because I don't want to break it, but it's very light. Uh, and this is actually, uh, an octopus made this. The paper Nautilus is an octopus, um, which is just an amazing thing. The female makes this thing and it, it actually puts a bubble of air inside of it uh, to control its buoyancy. So what it, it change it the size. Of it goes to the surface. Oh, but it how does it to the mean, surface. It, it, it excretes it. It's just uh -huh. a calcium thing that it excretes. Oh. And you'll see in these pictures it in different stages of development. And this is a small one. They get they can get like this big. That's and amazing. it's an octopus. The, and they float around. The male doesn't do this. Uh, and this is one of the males that actually detaches an arm. And the arm goes to the female and um, that's how fertilization happens. Um, hmm. And we're, we're assuming that's because that the female will eat the male and the male yeah. does not want to be eaten. Um, so there's a couple species that do that. It's bizarre and awesome and very cool. Wow. Um, so this is a, I love this stuff. Um, so anyway, this is what uh, the, it looks like. <clears throat> um, so it's an octopus with all its octopus pieces in the shell. I want you to remember this picture when we get to some of the other octopuses later. Um, you'll see the same kind of position. Um, here's two of them at the surface. This is from that Blackwater site I was telling you about. Wow. Uh, Mike Bartik is a guy who does a lot of these photos. It's, it's amazing the images they're capturing. Um, so you can see two different sizes. Uh, they find these at night. Uh, they also use jellies as, um, as a <laughs> hitching post and as protection and as food. Um, so they will, they will actually drill through the bell of the jelly and steal food from the, 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 that the jelly's dissolving. That is um, wild. Yeah. And if you see them in the wild, which I've only seen once, they're almost impossible to get a picture of because they'll take that jelly and put it between them and you. <laughs> Right. So, so you try to get around and it just follows you like this. So you need like two other people to distract it so you can get in to actually see it or take a photo of it. It's, this it's is incredible. amazing. I didn't even know these existed. Right? And this is like, mind so, that's, I was like, this one has got to go on the list because it's just so cool. Yeah. I would love to work with this one. Um, now that we're seeing all of them, um, that they're seeing them regularly, we kind of are getting an idea of, 
of, of when the smaller ones are around and what they might need. You know, 15 years ago, I would have said, there's no way we should try these uh, because they're pelagic, they're out in the water column. <clears throat> I think we could do it now. You'd need a huge, huge tank with nothing in it, which would be really boring and horrible, um, except for an idiot like me who loves this kind of stuff. But anyway, <laughs> You can see it's hitching the ride on top of the, uh, the jelly. It's just amazing. Here's one with no shell doing the same thing. So and these are, these are photographs. Yeah, these are actually photographs. photographs. Okay. This is uh, probably very hard to video uh, because they're getting focus and taking that snapshot in the dark. So they have a focus light and then bam. Uh, so video be moving around so much it'd be hard to see, I think. Uh, here you can see on this one, that little pad on the top is the, the start of, of the excretion of, of the shell. That one I think is actually inside of a cell. Oh, here we go. How about this? You want to know about gregariousness? Here's a bunch of them, right? I'm pointing at the screen like you can see me pointing. <laughs> but here, here's an eye. Here's an eye. Here's an eye. Um, uh, I'm not quite sure about these down here, but there's, oh, and here's an eye. So there's at least four baby, tiny, tiny uh, Argonauts is their common name inside of a salp. So they use the salp for protection, hitch a free ride. They're much happier. Inside really, of a what? Really. A salp, it's a, a, it's a colonial organism that's mm -hmm. pretty much hollow and it floats around and swims around. Mm -hmm. uh, and it eats. I think they'll probably uh, get a free meal out of it too from time to time. Just an amazing thing. Yeah. Just, just wild. And then you know, and I, and I love when it's small. When the when the shell isn't big enough, it just looks like a top hat. Um, yeah. So yeah, just a crazy, crazy cool animal. Uh, the next one, Octopus churchii. This is uh, this is one of the fantasy animals that I got to work with as well. Thought we'd never even see this at all. That's what it looks like. Um, a lot of black, kind of dark and light striped animals for me here. Um, yeah. uh, this is the one that we knew about a little bit uh, from a couple of little notes in the literature that seemed like a great octopus because it was small. It was in her title. Uh, you could keep it in a, in a small enclosure, right? A part of the problems with keeping some octopuses is they need so much space. Mm -hmm. um, that that they don't make good displays. I mean, they, they don't make good displays in anywhere unless they're being active. But this one was so small, we could keep it small. This is large egged. So we thought, oh, we could breed the ton. We could breed this a lot and this would be great, but we're never gonna see it because it's from the, the Pacific coast of Central America and no one really collects anything down there. Mm -hmm. uh, but then we were able to get some, me and Roy Caldwell and, um, and boy, oh boy, are they cool. Um, this is an arm tip behavior. The males do this. And they're also easy to sex. Uh, but So that's in a barnacle. And that's a male. And he's grabbed the crab and the crab, complete ambush. The crab had no idea that was coming. Uh, and uh, these guys often live inside a snail shell or at a barnacle. Again, de-evolving. Uh, and they often have that one arm between their eyes. I think it's because it breaks up the pattern even more. Uh -huh. um, they'll often pick up the shell and move around with it, uh, a lot like a snail. A very, very cool animal. Uh, very small. Scale, about, yeah. About the size of uh, that one's smaller, about the size of my thumbnail. Oh my gosh. Very small animal, <laughs> uh, but a very, very cool animal that I never thought I would see. Um, much less be able to work with. Uh, the mating is very gentle. Um, the females on the left, the males on, no, it's not gentle at all. Because the, <laughs> I was like, really? <laughs> the male, the male, this is one of the ones where we assume that there could be real problems with mating where the female might want to eat yeah. the male. Uh, you can see the male is staying as far away from the mouth parts as we can possibly see. Um, the, you know, the male is, is here on top. Uh, I guess that's the end of that. The male, this is the female, this is the male, um, stays away from the mouth. Um, the hectocotylized arm does the fertilization and then the male gets away. Mm -hmm. um, now we have found, oh, there's the picture, great. Uh, and you can see here, this is, can you see my cursor moving? Uh -huh. Yeah, 
That's the male arm. And on the tip of those arms, there's all these little papillae. They look like fuzz. Mm -hmm. And the female does not have that. So they're very easy to sex. If right. you're mating almost any other octopus, except this one's cousin, mm -hmm. you're guessing if you have, oh, well, no, a wonder puss as well. It's hard, it's hard to tell right. the males from the females. This is super easy, which is great. Um, now, I'm jumping ahead. But there is the octopus, the larger Pacific striped octopus that mates beak to beak. Mm -hmm. um, we have found if you allow these octopus more naturalistic surroundings, like shells and dens, that the female will come to the den and these guys also may mate that way. Um, but uh, we never did that because it's impossible to know if the animal's healthy or alive if it lives in a shell. Because uh -huh, you see. might not see it for days. So right. what I actually did was take barnacles and cut the end off and put a window on it, so I could see what was going on. Oh wow! Uh, yeah. But now, oh. now, now I wouldn't be as worried because we know more. Uh, it's so bizarre and exciting to be trying to figure things out on this level. Like I, I, I was thinking about the the dwarf cuddle, the Cepheid bandensis. It's just a given now that you can get them. Um, mm -hmm. you know, the public aquarium that, and, and it certainly wasn't when I started with them. And even right. I forgot that it was like, oh yeah, I've just assumed that they're available now, but wow. What a, what an amazing thing involved in. Right. Um, mm -hmm. we saw the mating and we saw this, uh, here's a large egg octopus. You can see the egg is big, mm -hmm. uh, and you can see the octopus is inside of it. You can see the arms are developed much longer than any of those planktonic ones we saw. And right. here's the eye of the female. And um, yeah, this is inside the egg. And I was able to get some pictures from the other side as well. Um, and these guys are really interesting because <clears throat> every Mother's Day, we hear the story of the octopus that gives all for its babies. And um, it, it's hundreds of thousands of egg hatches and then she dies, mm -hmm. which is a great story. I mean, it's a compelling story. I don't know how great it is for the octopus, but it's compelling. Um, this one doesn't do that. This one's what's called iter iteroporous. So this one actually eats while it's brooding eggs. And then as soon as it's done brooding eggs, it'll go out and mate again and lay some more eggs. Hmm. Um, it does not have that off switch in its genetics that a lot of other octopuses have, which is phenomenal and super awesome. Hmm. Um, Interesting. Let's see what this is. This is a baby. There is absolutely no scale in there, but it's eating an amphipod. Um, and the amphipods are probably five millimeters long for scale. So you can see this is the head of the amphipod and this is the tail and they eat a lot. A tiny right. little thing like that will, will digest all of the good bits inside of that crustacean. Uh, we'll eat the whole thing. You'll find the whole shell empty. Yeah. That's Amazing. Impressive. Yeah. Uh, so here's some scale. The one on the left is freshly born or hatched. The one on the right is at about 85 days. This was to show growth early on, but we're, you know, I, uh, getting them to eat and feeding them enough is difficult. Um, and keeping them is difficult because um, we, they eat each other. So they, and they want to escape from everything. So, so raising these in mass has not turned out to be easy. We haven't mm -hmm. quite cracked it. The, the The easiest thing is to get a bunch of students or interns to do a whole lot of work that is completely repetitive and do it every single day for 80 days. Because mm -hmm. um, uh, you got to, if you want them to grow fast, you got to feed them three or four times a day. And you also have to be able to make sure that the thing you're keeping in gets water exchanges because they're so small that we have mesh uh, for water exchange, but the flow isn't that great. So mm -hmm. there's a whole lot of problems with raising these little guys. Right. Um, but then uh, you are able to get footage like this, which is kind of neat. Uh, these are tiny, tiny babies because um, I was trying to keep them together. <clears throat> um, um, they're sharing a piece of food. So they're, they're much less cannibalistic when there's enough food. Right. The problem is getting them enough food. So my idea with this is to keep them together and just flood them with food all the time. So there's just food, 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 food. It turns out that's a lot of food. Like, like you still have to fill this with amphipods for them to eat three times a day. It's these are we have not figured out how to make these easy yet. Yeah. Um, the the answer might be a huge tank 
that has screens so the babies can't get out and you just dump a ton of amphipods in there and just co-culture them together. And then eventually the babies will be big enough that you huh. can pull them out. Uh, yeah. I don't know anyone, who's, we haven't done that yet, but uh, that might be the answer. Uh, but who knows? It, again, I love that we just don't know things. Yeah. Uh, this is probably this one. This is the larger Pacific striped octopus. This tattoo. Um, <laughs> this was one we absolutely did not think we were going to see uh, because they're collected offshore in deeper water. But the reports were that they were, you know, there's one note in, in a proceedings from a conference from 82, I think it is, that uh, one guy, Arcadio uh, Ronice, um, had them and he wrote up a whole manuscript about them and described all these weird behaviors, the uh, interoperity where, you know, they mate all several times that they, that they live socially, that they're gregarious in groups, not just males and females together, but bunches of them um, <clears throat> that, uh, that the hectocotylus, which is the channel um, that moves the sperm packets out is um, permanently colored. So they're easy to see um, easy to sex. Um, a whole whole bunch of stuff, um, some weird hunting behaviors. Um, it was so weird at the time when he tried to get it published, he got trashed in peer review. And I mean trashed, trashed, uh, so much that he kind of left science, which was horrible that yeah. he left science. It makes me very sad that that's what happened. Um, um, but we were able to get these uh, through bizarre happenstance, which was fantastic. Uh, and again, more screaming. Oh, by the way, the 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 smaller one, the churchier, the mating you saw, that was on my dining room table with four researchers around it at 9.30 at night, the camera, the <laughs> lights set up. It's the weirdest scene ever. And I just love that that's, I love that that kind of science still exists. Yeah. Um, anyway, so we were able to document everything that um, Arcadio said and he saw. Um, and we wanted to, this, this animal is actually doesn't, still doesn't have a scientific name. Um, oh, I didn't and know we that. asked him, yeah, we asked him, it's, there, there's pre ownership to that description. So mm -hmm. it gets a little weird about how that can move forward. Um, but we asked Arcadio if he wanted to be, should we name it after you? And he said, no, I'd rather be author. So he's an author on the paper, which is very exciting. Yeah. Um, and we were able to get it all done and published before he died. Which is, yeah. which just awesome. makes us, it's just so great. Anyway, yeah. this is what this beast looks like. Um, ah, oh, this is just everything to me. It's, it's got stripes and it's got spots. Who does that? <laughs> um, there's this margin between the stripes and the, the, the darker stripes and the lighter stripes. Um, I mean, this is just, this is straight out of science fiction. How, this is a Harryhausen animal. This this can't be, oh, that's a good name. It should be octopus uh, Harryhausen. Although <laughs> it gets its own, it's going to get its own genes because it and the Churchier are their own thing. They're related. Oh, really? Um, but um, I hope I'm not giving away anything I'm not supposed to give away. Um, oh, well, whatever. Oh, fire me. Um, this is... This octopus is everything for me. I think this is the coolest thing I've ever seen in my life and that I was able to work with them is insane. This is the first one that we that we got. Uh, we still weren't sure we were necessarily getting it. Um, the guy we were working with who was collecting the smaller ones for us, the lessers, <clears throat> the, the in the vernacular, Chirchia is called the lesser Pacific striped octopus. This one is called the larger Pacific striped octopus, mm -hmm. um, which is terrible. It should be the smaller and the larger, at least then the acronym, the initial would be different. Right. Anyway, this was on un un unpacking and I, I was shaking that, 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 that we saw them. We were able to get five to start with just, just incredible. Um, again, we didn't, we didn't know what we were doing uh, and we didn't know what we could trust and what we couldn't trust. Um, so in the back there is the female mm -hmm. and she's in a den and you'll see this again later, but that looks kind of like how the Argonaut is in its shell, right? Hmm. Uh, so yeah. she's in her own critter keeper. She's in her own tank that's sealed so the, they can't interact, but they can okay. see each other. Mm -hmm. And this is the male on the critter keeper. Um, and you'll see this 
color change and then this bottle color thing where on one half of his mantle he'll be one color and on the other half he'll be the other color um oh man that's wild here we go watch this okay so <laughs> i'm kind of on the left and the female's kind of on the right so he's much more unhappy with me giving me a dark aggressive coloration than he is with the female. Oh, it's like a he's, perfect split. Yeah. Isn't that wild? So he's kind of like, Hey baby on his right side. And he's like, get away from me, dude on the left side. Mm -hmm. um, it's pretty. And it even extends through the arms. It's just, it's amazing. I, oh, I'm going to make sounds like that because these animals okay. are just so cool. <laughs> Seems fair. <laughs> Oh, it's wild, yeah. Uh, here's a, a video of hunting and house cleaning. This is pretty cool. And again, you know, we didn't, we, th these animals were, that's a female. And again, kept uh, sequestered. Didn't want them to escape. Uh, didn't want them to eat each other. But the hunting is very much, the, at least in this instance, is a lot like um, the, the smaller one. They also will eat, eat snails. They drill a hole. Oh, watch this. So it's got the pieces of, the crab that it doesn't want around. So it leaves its den and then spits them out. Now, of course that totally backfired because of where she is, but right. it it, this, this octopus doesn't even want a midden around. It just wants all yeah. this stuff away. It's just very, 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 very cool. Yeah. And would the, would the midden actually signify to other animals that that was a dangerous place to hang out? I, I, I'm not sure if that's a, I mean, we see it as a midden. I mean, one of the things that you're right. looking for when you're hunting big octopus is signs of them. That's what uh -huh. makes some of these smaller ones that live in shells so much harder to find. They just I don't see. den in the same kind of way. Yeah. Huh. Um, so this is a crazy hunting behavior that we documented um, that hadn't been seen where you're going to see the octopus reach an arm up and over the shrimp, tap the shrimp on the opposite side from the octopus, which scares the shrimp into the octopus. You know, like when you tap your friend on his shoulder from behind. So the shrimp's going, I'm scared. <laughs> but then the octopus reaches out over and then the, the shrimp has got no choice but to run to the octopus where then it gets eaten. Super cool. Yeah, that's wild. Uh, and then here they are. This is male and female cohabitating in the same pipe. Turns out PVC pipe is a great way. Um, to, it's a great den for these kind of animals. Um, and then I made a bunch of glass dens because you could see in and I thought that's much cooler. But they're absolutely in the same thing, not killing each other. Uh, oh. Mating. Here's some mating. You can see that this is, again, it's going to be very gentle. Um, actually, it's a little less gentle, but um, it, but a very different mating strategy. Beak to beak. So the most dangerous parts, and you can see here, sorry, wait, let me get the cursor. This arm here is now gone inside the female in her mantle cavity. There's no, it's not like people. It's just a deposit of a packet of, of genetic material. And you'll be able to see one of the spermatophores actually sticking out in a second. These guys make long spermatophores that look like whips, whereas uh, cuddles look like little uh, little fuzzy blobs. Uh, right there, here, if you can see where my cursor is, that's a spermatophore sticking out. Oh, uh, yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, and, I, and I think in a minute you'll see another one. So not always do the spermatophores take. Some of them are ejected before the female uses them. And it's probable that she can store multiple spermatophores and pick which, which sperm she actually wants to use to, um, to uh, fertilize an egg. Here's another one as well. Um, all right, there we go. So this was also on the living on the dining room table. Um, but just super amazing stuff. And then we were totally scared how, and then, it, then now they're balling up, right? Are they fighting? Is this part of the, is this part of it? Are they going right. to let go of each other? How long am I willing to risk this? There's only five of them. We may never get any more again. Um, so I, I, the video stopped and I broke them up. Um, mm -hmm. 
until we learned that it was okay. Huh. Um, these guys lay eggs in a bizarre way. I think they're medium sized eggs. Uh, they usually lay two at a time and they're usually connected um, and they will continuously lay eggs. So because we didn't have enough of them, being able to isolate eggs, being able to know when an egg was laid and track its development just we was not possible. Um, but they just, it's just, there's always eggs hatching in these guys. They're just constantly laying. Um, boy, was I happy with this photo of, a, of one coming yeah. out of an egg. Boy, did I chase that for about three months. Uh, very happy with that. Um, yeah. Emerging from the egg. Wow. Okay. Uh, here's for scale. <clears throat> Oh my gosh. <laughs> the, this, uh, the scale down here is actually in yards. So this is a huge, no, that's millimeters. <laughs> um, Good one. So they're very teeny. I like putting them in a, in a drop of water because um, everyone also knows what a drop of water, that's literally a drop of water. Yeah. Um, and you can see it's very different than, than the lesser Pacific babies, which are just babies, which are just tiny octopus and move around. Um, so that's why I call this a meat. The, the egg is big but it puts out a larva that looks like this. Mm -hmm. um, and it's more developed than like the Wonderpus larva by a long length. So maybe it's an in-between kind of deal. Yeah. Uh, and feeding these guys is just a nightmare. You need the, the right kind of food at the right size at the right time because these guys grow so rapidly. So I was able to get a confirmed feed of the, of the larvae. Uh, you can see up in here, um, these white things and kind of this uh, carapace of a sh shrimp. This is actually a cleaner shrimp that we were breeding babies with. And mm. we were throwing everything at these guys, trying to get them to eat. This is our team or baby brine shrimp in here. These guys never looked at that um, at all. So, you know, feeding a planktonic tiny thing with other tiny planktonic things is just, is just a tough one. Um, yeah. And since then, we haven't seen any more of these. There was supposed to be an expedition uh, to a new location that had them in Baja. Uh, where was it? I don't remember. Somewhere. Somewhere. Um, was it in Baja? Is it in Baja? Yeah, but Baja is big, so I'm not giving anything away. Great. Um, uh, but COVID has completely ruined all of that. Um, yes. So hopefully, hopefully. And I was supposed to do an expe uh, expedition to Nicaragua, where they are, to film them in the wild, which hasn't been done yet. We don't know enough about them, uh, but there was a bunch of civil unrest and made it unsafe for us to go for two years mm -hmm. running. Uh, and then that grant expired. So maybe maybe that'll happen again in the future. Maybe it won't. I I'm sure it will eventually. Um, there's just so much more to learn about these guys. The last mm -hmm. piece of footage is the female tending her eggs. And before it starts, I'll point out the different eggs. So here here's an egg here and here there's a few more but they're completely clear um those are very fresh the ones with the little spots that's an eye spot starting to develop in the in the in the in the development of the embryo inside and then you can see them getting oranger and that's with a fully more formed uh baby hatchling ready to emerge so there's just all kinds of different yeah. stages development going on and you'll see that in the video and you'll see some octopuses uh get um left get oh you can see down in right there already there's a bunch ready to come out and yeah. she tends them and she grooms the eggs all the time making sure that they have proper water flow around them making sure that uh any eggs that are going bad she'll remove um and then there's babies floating around in the water that we wow. then collect and try to raise um Really, really, really amazing stuff. Yeah. Wow. That's where that's where baby octopus comes from. <laughs> and end of slideshow. That's that's the pictures I've got for you. Oh, I mean, that was that was amazing. Thank you so much for putting it together and walking us through all of that. Um, to, <laughs> <tomorrow>. Sorry. <laughs> hmm? Oh, we have questions. Yeah, excellent. Just a couple. I know we're running long, but I was just laughing because um, Tamara wrote, my kid was watching this until until Rich said, here they are mating. And then my kid ran away and said, no, thanks. <laughs> Good for the kid. She knows what she wants. Yeah. Um, a quick question from Joseph about how often they lay eggs. And I know that, that probably varies by species, but maybe just specific yeah. to the last one. 
the 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 last one they she just uh, never stopped laying eggs all right. the way up to when right. they die. Um, okay. Other species lay eggs once, and that's it. Um, mm -hmm. The cuddles the cuddles lay lots of eggs as well. They don't. They're okay. not some. They're, they're not semiparous. They're interparts. Lots of all the time. It's it's mainly mainly the octopus that has that story. Um, it's the female as well that guards the eggs and then dies. Males generally can mate lots of times before they die. Okay, cool. And we're, and actually, uh, let's see. Oh, Ida asked, I'll just ask this one last one. She asked, do you ever have any issues with inking in the tanks and have to do quick water changes? Yeah, uh, not anymore. Um, the, early on, learning on how to move these animals around, I, I had some inking events. Or sometimes when one comes in, you know, after being shipped, um, mm -hmm. it'll come in an ink or come in an ink. Um, some of the places um, that work with, the bigger animals more have inking events. The old NRCC, the National uh, Resource Consortium for Cephalopods, they, they're, they're defunct now. They uh, they had some problems. They were the, the European cuttlefish is commonly raised for science, um, and that one can be an ink monster and can definitely overrun your 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 filtration system. So while I haven't had problems, I'm prepared for it. Um, I here I've got probably five to 700 gallons of fresh, uh, of new salt water ready to go all the time in case I need to do something like that. The public aquariums always have the salt water around as well. Um, mm -hmm. and the filtrate, the main thing from the filtration is to keep the, 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 the problem with the ink is it clogs their gills and then they suffocate. Mm -hmm. So, um, even if there's a lot of ink in the water, you can keep that, you can put a lot of agitation in the water and break up the ink so it can't glob on as much. Uh, but oh. yeah, that's a long answer yeah. to a simple question. Mm -hmm. um, William would like to know whether there are any species of cuttlefish endangered. I don't think there are any that are on the, on the, on the red list or actually endangered yet. Um, mm -hmm. but that's probably a function of not knowing, right. uh, what their populations are really like that. We just mm -hmm. don't, we just don't really know. We know about the cephalopods more that are used as food. Um, but we don't really know. So I, I would say they're all in danger. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. Yeah. Um, and let's see a last one from Heather. Uh, how big did the larger Pacific octopus get? And have you ever done any studies of them? So yeah, we did a lot of work with the larger Pacific octopus. Um, uh, there's a the paper on them. Um, oh, it turns out that the patterned octopuses, the wonderpus, and the um, mimic? the the mimic, I don't know about, uh, mm -hmm. but they they all have patterns that are unique to them. So you can oh. actually identify individuals from the pattern. So the paper oh, wow. on that for the wonderpus. Um, I'm sorry, I've lost myself now in what the question was. How big is the LPSO? Oh, the LPSO, LPSO yeah. is about as big as my fist, about like a tangerine. Mm -hmm. uh, and then uh, there was a well, second part to that. She actually asked two. She asked how big did the larger oh. Pacific octopus get? And then she asked if you had done any with the giant Pacific octopus. So it's like two. Oh, with a giant Pacific I've I've two only one. worked tangentially with the GPO. Mm -hmm. um, uh, that's just, a, it's a, it's a cold water animal and I'm more of a warm water guy, uh, where my expertise is. Um, so yeah, I, I, I've done some work with them, but not, not a ton, which is okay, okay. with me. Yeah. I get to work with all these. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. And if people have, we didn't get to everybody's questions, but if people have more or want to find you, is Twitter a good place to refer them? Um, or not so much these days. Sure. I, I don't see Twitter much, but I'm there. I'm Seth head on Twitter. Uh, you can hit me there. I do, I do look at it from time to time and I'm happy to answer questions when I see them. I just may not get back to them right away. Okay. Uh, but, mm -hmm. not, but now that we've said that, I'll be looking for the next <laughs> few days for sure. Okay. And we'll drop a link to that in comments as well. Um, I will, I'll start to wrap up here. I'll just say that um, Breakfast Club viewers come back on Tuesday, this Tuesday, the 25th, we'll have a virtual tour of our herpetology collections, which is snakes and lizards and frogs and weirder stuff um, with our curator, Dr. Rena Bell, and our collections manager, Lauren Scheinberg. And then just before we leave, one thing that I haven't um, 
said before, but as the Academy is getting ready to enter our sixth month of closure, um, we do need your support more than ever. And we know times are really hard right now. So if your support just means continuing to watch and engage with programs like this, that's awesome. That's enough. Um, but if you are able to comfortably give, we would be so grateful for literally any amount. Um, if you're watching on Facebook, there's a donate button. If you're on YouTube, there's a donate link in the description. Um, and also, if you've ever thought about just becoming a member, we would love to have you in our member family as well. And this is a great time for it. Um, so with that, Rich, thank you so much again. It was so fun. You're welcome. I hope we can You're welcome. Can I make two quick back? plugs? Can yeah, I make two quick plugs? If people want more information, I'm sorry. I, I should have had a note on this earlier. Uh, if you want more information on these cephalopods, the Academy websites have a bunch of it. Um, my website, which is in transition right now, but it's mostly done, therichross.com has got all my articles and everything about it. And then uh, even more is um, tonmo.com, a T-O-N-M-O. It stands for the uh, the online tonmo, the octopus news magazine online, tonmo.org. Um, is a long, long lasting community of, of cephalopod enthusiasts where I started and got all the information. So that's also a great resource. So okay. tonmo.com or .org is where to check. There we go, okay. there. I would no, feel remiss that? not giving, giving those direction. And we'll drop those in the links as well so that people can check them out after. Oh, Thank you. you're yeah. the best. Hey, you're the I best. <laughs> Thank you. Right on. Thanks, everyone.